There is a coalition forming that has been dubbed by one of the biggest members of this coalition, RFK Jr., the Justice League. And so in this video, we're going to actually explore the implications of this coalition, which has already caused massive waves across the political landscape, the implications it holds for the future of the American Republic. And we're also going to look at more generally the idea of superheroes and the idea of the actual fictional Justice League and see if we can draw some parallels between what is happening in the realm of literature and, fa and fantasy and what is also happening right now in our politics. Because we understand that there is a necessary uh, synergy between what happens in the realm of the mind and what actually occurs in real life. But before we get into all that, my friends, hope all of you are doing well. I am Christian Watson. If you enjoy political and social commentary with a philosophical bent, then I must implore you, please, like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you can to get our message out there. This is a channel for people who want to think beyond stage one. This is a channel for people who want to actually understand some of the broader themes that characterize the way we understand and talk about our politics. This is a channel for people that want to get in touch with the ethos of our republic here in America, or who just simply want to learn more about Western civilization in general. So if those things interest you, then please support me. You can, again, share, comment, subscribe. You can even donate if you want to. That's up to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here, my friends. And now please enjoy the video. So I've actually been a fan of the Justice League for a very, very long time, talking about terms and such. And this term is relevant because RFK Jr. Uh, used the term the Justice League after he announced that he was going to suspend his presidential campaign and after Tulsi Gabbard announced that she was actually going to endorse Donald Trump, and she did so in a rather, I think, a rather profound way, much like RFK Jr. did in a rather profound way. He called this the Justice League, and there are, of course, memes floating around on the internet, and there are, of course, other commentaries floating around that basically say that this coalition is going to reshape the nature of American political discourse, is going to reshape and realign the parties and the ideologies of the parties, and it's going to also push Trump more to the center. I think what a lot of people are not realizing when they make these comments or when they, brought, when they draw these broad conclusions is that coalitions are not nascent phenomena. Coalitions are nothing new. In fact, coalitions, if you look at the history of American politics, are actually as old as our country. If you look at the history of a political ideas going beyond the American context, Coalitions are actually integral to the kind of government we have here in America, the classically Republican idea of government. In fact, uh, this is not really understood by a lot of people, so I have to go into it for a short period of time. Coalitions embody the principle of mutual cooperation and the meeting out of individual actions that is integral to a republic. Checks and balances is this meeting out of actions, right? It's this checking different parts of the government, checking other parts of the government. But also, it implies that there has to be a cooperation between different parts of the government. And in this case, if you're going to be able to affect politics, you must also, even if you're not in the government, also be willing to cooperate in some way, shape, or form. Now, some people take this principle to mean that compromise is the highest virtue in politics. It's not, because compromise can only be coherent and non-injurious to the country if compromise happens within the context of mutual principles. So if we both agree, for example, that murder is wrong, the compromise will not be to allow some people to murder sometimes in some ways to, so as to reduce murder. The compromise can only be how can we best ensure murder never happens. We may need to take incremental steps, but our ultimate goal is to ensure murder never happens, not to actually endorse the thing that we're supposed to be against. So I just wanted to clarify that. But when I, when I heard the term, when I heard RFK Jr. said the term Justice League, I was transported back to my childhood. Some of you who watch this channel may not know I am 24 years old, so I have a lot of memories of some of the cartoons of the early 2000s. And there were two cartoons that I, I absolutely loved. I was a big fan, and still am a big fan, of the superhero genre. There was Justice League Unlimited, which was a cartoon that began in the early 2000s. Then there was Justice League, the just like the precursor to that, which like began in like 2001. 
And Unlimited was a successor to Justice League Unlimited. And basically, it depicts these coalition of superheroes who all have their own stories, who all have their own universes, who all have their own constellation of antagonists and villains coming together for a common cause. Some people in the Justice League, some of the, some of the, the members of the Justice League would be people like Batman or the Green Lantern the, uh, or, uh, or the Green Arrow or, or uh, the Question, who was a detective. A very enigmatic figure, who I think is actually a very interesting character in general, so on and so forth. And and the Justice League is not always a perfect cooperative unit. The Justice League actually demonstrates philosophically the vulnerabilities that come with having such great power and having such great ability. In a certain way, the Justice League conceptually conveys the same message that the classically Republican system of government also conveys that no one person should have all the power or most of the power, not because power corrupts, but because people are differently able to do different things and power is best working towards just ends when it is distributed and not concentrated. Why am I talking about cartoons to you today, my friends? Very simply, because if we understand what's happening right now in the context of that Justice League metaphor I just used. We will then understand why this coalition is beneficial. Because RFK Jr., Tulsi Gabbard, and whoever else is apparently a cacophony of Democrats who are going to hop on to this coalition, whoever else joins are going to have a lot of skills, talents, and knowledge that will allow us to deal with the challenges of the day. The reason I said it's a mistake to consider this particular event as this panacea for the political divide in the country. The reason I said it's a mistake to consider this a sign of things to come is because too many people are focused on the personalities involved in this coalition, Donald Trump, RFK Jr., Tulsa Gabbard, and not enough on what the coalition represents. You see, Coalitions are just the vessels for ideas, just like people are vessels for ideas, and ideas outlast people. Ideas outlast personalities. The idea of the Justice League, the idea of having a superhero will outlast a particular person, and it will continue to translate itself into the futures. Ideas are self-replicating. So when you understand this, you will have a more detached perspective, but also a more holistic perspective on what this coalition represents. There are three primary areas that need to be addressed that I believe this Trump coalition can address in a Justice League satisfaction that RFK Jr., Tulsi, and others are uniquely equipped to address. There are three areas. Number one, national security. Number two, the administrative state. Number three, patriotism. Let's go down the list here. I'll be very brief. National security. This single word, and I just did a very big video about what national security actually means. And I'll be very short. It's a symbol. It is a political symbol. A political symbol is an idea, concept, definition that has an imprecise meaning, but manages to rile up a certain kind of response to understanding within somebody, so much so that a propagandist or a bad actor or a rhetorician can then take that word and then define it how they want to define it and then use it to do things that may be bad, like, for example, spend trillions of U.S. taxpayer dollars bombing the Middle East, like, for example, destabilizing regimes around the world in the name of being a humanitarian, when in all reality, our interventions caused more humanitarian situations than the dictators abusing their own citizens did. Whatever it might be, whether it be divorcing national obligation from the concrete context of the nation and, and putting it in the hands of the UN and NATO and internationalist groups, whatever it might be, national security has been so loosely defined and weaponized by power interests to degrade the spirit of the American ethos and also to degrade our own obligations to our citizens. RFK Jr.'s family has been uniquely impacted by this because there is musings that the death of both his uncle and his father were caused by sinister interests within the United States government. Tulsi Gabbard is being surveilled for her political beliefs by the Biden administration. Now, for those of you who just say, well, it's the Biden administration doing this, or it's the Biden FBI doing this, I have to stop you. Because this is a system. 
Biden is simply the latest very the latest version of this systems administrator. You know how computer systems have administrators and them and whatever. This is the latest version of that. The computer, the system, has been around long before Biden came into being. So let's actually confront this. So the national security establishment is fundamentally a threat to the American America, the American people. They are fundamentally a threat to our God-given rights. They are fundamentally a threat to the social cohesion of America. They are fundamentally a threat to establishing sound foreign policy. How can I say this? Because the, the national security establishment passed the Patriot Act in the name of protecting us in all reality that simply allowed them to intrude more into private society. When there's no barrier between civil, but between government and private society, there can be no corrective for tyranny because the corrective for tyranny comes comes in from private society, this will become important when I talk about patriotism. Not only that, but the same national security establishment has so weakened the Americans' ability to, to ensure national security by spreading us thin in the name of proselytizing grand American ideas around the world. Given RFK Jr. and Tulsi's uniqueness in their understanding of these issues, I think they will have an immense impact, and also Trump's temperament on these issues. They will have an immense impact on hopefully correcting the ship in this regard, in reigning in that establishment, and on pushing policies that are based on a realist perspective, that are based on an America first in the strictest sense perspective, the same perspective that Senator Robert Taft had, the same perspective that the, that the old right intellectuals of the 20s had, that America's obligation must be to itself, and that also must mean that our efforts will be primarily focused here. I believe that is what could possibly be a good part of this coalition. Second kind of leads into the first, the administrative state. So just as there is a national security establishment, there's also an administrative state. Now on this channel, I've discussed the administrative state on so many occasions. So I'm not going to belabor the point. If you really want to know my full views of the administrative state, I, I have a few videos in the past. I have one big lecture coming up in the future that I'll go into. But very simply, I'll, I'll define the administrative state as the bureaucratic institutions of our government that ostensibly are there to help the government run better, but exist in contravention, in negation of the separation of powers principle of the United States Constitution. Let's actually go deep here because some of you may say, well, Christian, we already know this. Okay, let me, uh, may help you out a little bit more. The separation of powers implies three principles. Number one, the non-delegation principle. The non-delegation principle says that a, a branch over here cannot give their power to a branch over there. Number two, the non-combination principle. The non-combination principle is a corollary of the non-delegation principle. The non-combination principle simply says you cannot have combined powers within one single branch that would tread on the other branch's territory. The third principle is the transparency principle. This is an informal way of putting it. The transparency principle simply says you have to have an executive that is able to correct the abuses of those within its own branch. Well, through so many different court rulings and legislation that happened over the course of the early 20th century, the, trans the, the, the transparency and accountability principle was actually uh, diffused because there are entire parts of the executive branch called civil servants that cannot be held accountable by the chief executive. So we have these three principles that make up the crux of separation of powers that have been absolutely, completely and utterly ignored by the powers that be by the previous administrations, with the exception of Donald Trump, who unfortunately stepped into this, not knowing all of this, these different, di different things, and therefore he's blindsided by it. It's been the status quo for decades, since probably before many of you were born. And that is a fundamentally a problem. Well, RFK Jr. and Tulsi both understand this problem pretty well, and they can be good voices on handling this. The third area that I want to talk about is patriotism. And this is where I have to get into the superhero archetype. To call this the Justice League is to suggest that RFK Jr., Tulsi, and Trump, and whoever else joins them, are a league of superheroes. But if we investigate the archetype of the superhero, We'll learn something very quickly. It's that superheroes are not defined by their greatness. They're actually defined by how they act in the face of their faults. Meaning that superheroes are oftentimes given this expectation 
that they're supposed to be these great saviors of mankind. But oftentimes they face resistance from the very people they're supposed to save. And this resistance may be passive. This resistance may not even be intentional. The people may appreciate the superhero, but the resistance may be in the form of mediocre habits that make it difficult for the superhero to do their job. Think about Batman, for example. So Batman in several movies, like for example, in The Dark Knight, which I think is one of my favorite movies. The first one, with Heath Ledger, God rest his soul. Batman was constantly villainized by the press, constantly villainized by the people. He was called a vigilante, and throughout the Batman lore, this is, this is the case as well. He's called a vigilante. He's called the Cape Crusader, and people are just very, very... Uh, uh, suspicious of him. This is why the Joker tries to attack Batman's image because he can't really attack what Batman's trying to do because it's good work, but he can attack his image, which is already so fraught with certain mediocre ideas that people have about how the law should be enforced. Batman is outside of their expectations. And so people in their own capacities are able to stop the superhero from doing what he's supposed to do simply by opposing what they're supposed to do. In other words, the superhero can't save you from yourself. Even Superman has kryptonite. So here, what am I saying? A classically Republican society is fundamentally a society of self-directing peoples. It's a society of peoples who are morally assertive and who are intellectually curious and who hold both government authority, and also hold social authority, social institutions, accountable to what they're supposed to do as determined by their foundations, as determined by their ethos. In absence of that, a kind of society that America has, the kind of society that America's civilization is predicated upon, cannot exist. And no Superman, no Batman, no Wonder Woman, no Green Arrow, no Green Lantern, no Justice League, no RFK, no Trump, no Tulsi, no one can save you from things that you are supposed to be doing as an American citizen. The superhero is not defined by his godlike ability. The superhero is defined fundamentally by the humanity that is found within the midst of all this exceptionalism. What defines Batman? The fact that he lost his parents. Watched a thug shoot his parents. That entire thing set him on a course. It, it, it colored his image. That's why he wears dark. It covered his perspective of the world. Everything. That's the story of Batman. Not that he is able to throw around gadgets and get people or that he fights crazy psychopaths with paint on their face. No, 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 no. It's that, that darkness. He channels it into something positive. And that is a human thing that all of us can do in our own lives. Therefore, we can be our own superheroes. If we wish to really save our republic, we need to go beyond considerations of policy. And we need to continue to embody or begin to embody that moral assertiveness that a country like ours requires. The difference between a tyrannical system and a system based upon just governance is how both of those systems deal with the question of individual living. Or I'll, I'll put it more simply, how both of those systems deal with the question of the good. Now, that's the question, isn't it? The good. What is the best life? What is the most moral life? And how does that play out? Because a society of degenerates and evil people will ultimately produce a kind of political order that is reflective of that. But a society of virtuous people and intelligent people and, and, and resilient people will have a more restrained political order. But if we're looking for the government to be our superhero, or we're looking for people in the government to be our superhero, then we're not a society of vigilant people. We're a society of sheep, a society of followers, a society of servants. And that's not something that we need to embrace in this country. So whereas the Trump Justice League can help restore the republic on a policy level, they can also help us by turning the mirror towards us as Americans and compelling us within our hearts to say, okay, 
What do I need to do? What do I need to do in my own personal capacity? Do I need to go volunteer? Do I need to do what the Constitution societies of the early 1920s did in this country, which is go and hand out pamphlets of the Constitution to people and help people be literate about the government? Do I need to go start a YouTube channel? Do I need to be on Twitter? What do I need to do? Americans need to, to form their own Justice League. Because when that happens, then we won't need a small team of superheroes to save us from the future crisis. We won't need a Superman to fight Darkseid or a question to investigate life's problems. We'll all be able to be the superhero in our own lives, on our own levels. And in that way, we'll be able to save people that are the closest to us, save things that are near and dear to us, and create the kind of society that reflects that virtue of courage. That's what we need to do. Let this formation of this new coalition be a reminder for us here on the ground level to go ahead and do the same in our own way. My friends, thank you so much for being here and listening to me. I know this is a little bit of an odd video, but I'm an odd person, so you have to deal with that. So be sure to like my friends, comment, subscribe, do whatever you can. If you want to donate to me as well, you can go donate to me on PayPal, Patreon. My preferred method is you go to christianwatson.locals.com and join the community there. That's really sustainable and it really helps me a lot. My friends, study history, study philosophy, remain morally convicted, and please, 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 please watch more Justice League. It's on Netflix for free, I think. Um, watch more Justice League, and most importantly, Stay pensive. Bye, guys.